So, in London, in 1982, a year after being voted in, the Socialist Greater London Council, under the le leadership of uh, a younger Ken Livingstone then, created something called the Greater London Enterprise Board, with a budget of about 32 million quid, and uh, its role was to essentially rescue manufacturing in London and create jobs. But having a kind of socialist uh, ideology and, and perspective on these things, wanted to do that through, ideally, the creation of um, cooperative enterprises um, where industrial democracy would be practiced and the, the kind of products and goods being created in these rescued and reoriented firms and manufacturing would be uh, of a kind of socially useful kind. Okay, and as part of that, um, their technical director, someone called Mike Cooley, um, set up five technology networks. So these are community-based workshops, and as you'll see on the third bullet point there, the, the ambition was to combine what they saw as this untapped skill, creativity, and energy in London, amongst Londoners with the kind of more technical and codified knowledge and resources available in London's polytechnics. Okay? So five were set up, dotted around London, and you can see them listed there. The London Innovation Network, London New Technology Network, Energy and Employment Network, a Transport Network. And as I say, not only were they kind of, they were sort of funded and, and backed by the GLCs, okay? So they were sort of kind of municipal basis for them and had this sort of, these sort of um, left ideals to them. But, but both the GLC and, and these networks were also linked to a kind of broader sort of social movement that had been going since the sort of mid-1970s uh, to promote socially useful production and these sorts of ideals around industrial democracy and community participation in, in product development and, and uh, economic activity. Okay. Uh, so, I think what I'll do is I'll jump straight... No, this is... Uh, I'm going to jump straight to um, the kind of conclusions, if you like, because I haven't got a lot of time. And why, why is that relevant? Or what, I'll, I'll go back and explain what they did. What does it mean for today, OK? So, uh, I'm thinking about maybe maker spaces in particular, but maker culture today. Um, there are similarities with some maker spaces, I think. You know, open door workshops where people can access tools and so forth. And I think the lessons, what, what they kind of, what was happening then was they were responding to structural changes, okay, Ch changes in manufacturing, a restructuring of capitalism, okay, shifting out of investing in manufacturing in Europe, relocating things, new technologies coming through as well, okay, changes in society and so forth. And if you like, what the GLC was doing and what the movement for social use production was doing was, okay, what are the progressive possibilities with these changes then? And trying to figure out ways of ensuring these deeper-seated changes uh, could be put to social good, social benefit, I think. Now, obviously, it's a very different world now. Some of those ideas, uh, well, appear quite dated. Actually, maybe some of them are resurgent. It's interesting talking about this. Uh, after a week of concern about the de further decline of the steel industry, for example. Um, but maybe some of the fundamentals, even if it is a different world, we could argue how much it is and how much it isn't. I think some of the fundamentals remain the same, and that's what my preceding slides are going to talk about, really. Is the varied roles that prototyping can play in workshops. You know, what, what's the point of all this making activity or encouraging making in workshops? There's also the challenges involved. There's a, lot, there's, there's a lot of idealism then and opening up, you know, breaking down expertise, breaking down a lot of social divisions so, and having a more inclusive or participatory kind of making. That's part of their ambition in these workshops. But actually the challenges of doing that when these sort of divisions exist in the wider social world, okay? So if you like trying to create, I mean, socialism in one workshop when in the context of the wider world, okay? So if you're thinking in making, addressing maybe some of the issues around, I don't know, gender or class or educational training, formal training, then those are features that are kind of exist in the outside world beyond the workshop, and now you have to work very hard at it, I think, even within workshops. And then there was the, another lesson coming out of it was kind of connecting these sort of grounded practices of developing prototypes, thinking about products that would be socially useful and how they connect to the kind of big forces of political economy in terms of 
How do you get investment to turn these nice ideas into something um, uh, marketable, something you know that can be um, manufactured in some way, or that can actually get out there beyond the workshop, but also um, connected with social movements as well, and, and um, their demands for changes in politics and, and economy. Uh, and then this one was, so I do work on sustainable development, was how to orient this, the kind of material cultures and makers in making and making spaces to questions of sustainable development. What's interesting with the, 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 the um, technology networks was that um, there was an interest in like, environmental sustainability as well. Okay, so that's kind of the conclusion. Um, how do we get there? Uh, what was going on in the technology networks then? And like, this is where the sort of similarities and relevance of this history might become apparent. Is it was all about access to tools, providing tools for people, and expertise and training, and creating a convivial environment where people can engage in design and prototyping, access manufacturing tools, and new information and communication technologies then. These were walk-in workshops open to anyone. As I say, there were collaborations with the Polytechnics in London, um, but they were cited, the workshops were cited away from polytechnics because they were seen as alienating. You have to remember early 1980s, what, maybe five, ten percent of people went to university. So they were from most of the population, they were alien, weird, you know, quite um, just, uh, unknown things, okay? So there was a lot of thinking going on about how to make these things accessible. And, and what went on there, some of the examples listed there, uh, there was a women's computing cooperative set up. There was a, uh, a co-op called Brass Tax, which is about repairing and refurbishing white goods to give to poorer households. Someone pro developed an electric bike, and there was lots of attempts to try and find investment and funding for that to, com to um, uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, disability devices, play down equipment, and so on. And, and as you can see, things around sustainable energy as well. Okay? But also campaigns kind of came out of these spaces as well, so a campaign for addressing fuel poverty. And some of these ideas were registered in a product bank. Again, you can see where maybe there's certain analogies or relevance here, which was a, um, you know, just a, uh, a resource, obviously not online, uh, but uh, a, a kind of database, if you like, for, for, do, for, for depositing designs and prototypes and for sharing them. Okay? And through all of this, in the period it, these technology existed for, uh, you know, it was really about this kind of cultivating participatory design methods, prototyping product development, mobilising alliances and networks. So it was interesting that the, um, the London Energy and Employment Network, the first thing they said was, right, there's loads of fuel poverty in London, the housing stock's really poor. Um, we can develop loads of products or service ideas that will um, address that. And then they quite quickly realised that actually there was already lots of tools available to improve the thermal performance of people's homes. Um, what was missing, if you like, um, was a number of things. So one was um, a kind of systematic, scientific um, measurement of the poor performance of people's homes. Okay? The, the householders knew they lived in cold homes that were really expensive to keep warm. But to convince the authorities that, they had to kind of present that experience into a a formalized kind of knowledge that would cut it with the authorities. But also the, the network, the Energy and Employment Network, having realized that the challenge was getting, um, making the case that fuel poverty was something that needed to be tackled, that was really prevalent, um, and, get, uh, and getting these existing tools and technologies into the homes required a, a campaign and political action. So the network there became a kind of hub for an alliance around putting pressure on, back on the GLC, but also nationally to um, bring in uh, programs to address fuel poverty and, and resources to introduce these technologies and techniques into people's homes, which, which they achieved to some degree. Okay, so a variety of activities going on and purposes within the technology networks, within these workshops. Um, now, why were there some of these, you know, quite um, socially committed ideals? And I think to understand that, you have to understand that the technology networks were really a bit of a, a high watermark for a, a movement for socially useful production that was committed to making design, prototyping, questions of production subject to popular participation. Okay, and this really came out of um, 
reactions to um, manufacturing declining in, in the UK in the 1970s and um, what became sort of neoliberalism really but wasn't clear then, certainly wasn't ever self-evident that it was going to become so um, hegemonic, but um, a kind of, okay, how do we respond to the decline of manufacturing then? Um, and there was one initiative really that catalyzed a lot of this called the Lucas Plan, um, uh, which uh, came out of Lucas Aerospace. And the picture there is all the, the shop stewards, so the kind of local level uh, trades unionists that represented uh, workers in the Lu at Lucas Aerospace. Basically, under the threat of closures of plants, loss of jobs, they, they did all the usual things back then, so they went on strike, they occupied the factory, they resisted management decisions. But unusually, they also consulted their workers and came up with an alternative plan, an alternative strategy. So they kind of audited all the technology, all the tools in the factories, the skills people got, had, the ideas they had for putting that, those resources to the use of uh, their communities and their neighbours, rather than what they were currently doing and losing market share in doing, which was making equipment for um, uh, the defence sector, for the military, largely. Okay? Other, other things as well, but they were losing markets. So this was the idea. It's like, we don't want to lose our jobs. We, we should be um, all this public money that goes on paying our dole, that, that's going into um, helping invest, invest in industry to help them restructure and rationalise and remain competitive and all this money, public money that's going into buying the defence, the weapons that we're helping make, we think all that money should be invested in socially useful production. Okay? So this, again you can see the state playing this role as a, as, as a kind of investor and, um, uh, and supporter of, of uh, these products. Okay? And all sorts of people got interested in this, you know, for, for environmentalists and the peace movement, this idea of arms conversion, alternative technologies was really attractive. For the, for the new left in particular, this kind of grassroots industrial democracy and community participation was very exciting. But also they were quite um, open towards, or well, some of the leaders here uh, were quite open towards the new technologies that were coming in, the kind of automation that was just, and computer integrated manufacturing and computer aided design. Um, uh, and rather than resisting the technology, they were interested in how you might design it and shape it in ways that were skill enhancing. And rather than displacing jobs, they enhanced the role of the, the operative, if you like, the worker. And they had indeed had links with, pe with the, um, people like Pellien and, and people working in Scandinavia in the collective resource approach and participatory design there, where similar initiatives with designers working with trade unionists and workers to try and think how new technologies can be introduced in a skill-enhancing way. So there was a lot, you can imagine, like, all the, so there's a lot of kind of aspiration and values kind of um, bearing down on um, these technology networks, okay? Um, so what were the things that they were having to work out in technology networks in, under those, with that kind of context, if you like, having come from those sorts of movements? I think the first thing was that they learned was that open doors was only the start, you know? You might think that you want people to engage in participatory prototyping, cooperatives and so forth. But you need to convince people as well and reach out. So there was a lot, there was an awareness that you actually opening the spaces is only the first step. And what you need to do is community development. And you need to understand community development to get people in on their terms when it suits them and how. Okay? Uh, and there was, you know, there was some learning on that. As I said in my earlier slide, the workshops were not insulated from divisions in the wider social world. So, you know, divisions in terms of. Um, sort of formal training or expertise, giving people the confidence, uh, um, uh, revealing to some of the um, male managers of the workshops the highly gendered routines and assumptions they had as they went about working in the workspace and so forth. So trying to introduce um, processes and, and, and moments to kind of address that and, 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 and remove some of these divisions. So there's a lot of discussion and argument about that. Um, the role of prototyping in the workshop. So some people, it was all about training, creating jobs, uh, starting up enterprises. You know, it's a very practical and immediate 
but difficult thing to do. For others, the whole act of making and prototyping was much more maybe akin to critical making now. They had this term then called technological agitprop. Uh, and it was all about awareness raising and uh, making people um, think about bigger issues through an engaging activity. Okay? So rather than turn up to a you know, public meeting in the evening to debate what's wrong with the world, get, bring people in to make stuff and sort of introduce these issues in a much more engaging and um, constructive kind of way, if you like. They also learned that moving from prototyping, like the electric bicycle, trying to find investment for that to be made in London was really, really difficult. Okay? Um, you know, uh, and that was the whole point of the technology network, was to seed local jobs, really, in the instrumental sort of sense. So there's something there about actually control over or access to capital on your terms, okay, to get from prototyping to a, uh, an enterprise and into production. You can see that this was coming from trade unions, a very kind of productivist type of um, orientation about all of this. Um, and so to get that access over capital, you really need favourable political economies. And the aspiration then was actually the UK would move further to the left and we'd have uh, kind of um, socialist national governments as well as local governments. And you'd have that kind of capital being put to these purposes. Now, obviously, as a country, we moved in the opposite direction and this stuff sort of um, kind of withered away. Intriguingly, there was also opposition from the, the sort of heights of the Labour Party and the trade union movement who uh, um, didn't like all these upstarts saying that we had a right to decide what gets made and how. Um, that's another story. I'm running out of time to, to kind of go into that. Um, and what happened, basically, um, with this stuff is, is like I say, the, 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 the politics in the country went in a different direction. Um, Margaret Thatcher shut down the GLC in 1986 just disbanded it, along with a few other metropolitan authorities that were under the control of, uh, of the left. And, uh, and with that, the Greater London Enterprise Board and the funding for the technology network sort of disappeared. Some of them kept going for a while and turned into sort of training uh, organizations, okay? And, and there are various government programs for training people and, and skilling them up. And that's sort of how they managed to, to hold on for a while. But basically, it kind of just sort of... Um, dissipated and, and I think people also just lost a bit of energy and motivation especially under these adverse conditions but I think if you like with this la the last bullet point I think it didn't necessarily disappear you know you, you I think these sort of radical impulses are really important I think if you do look at the history of certain practices like say participatory design there is what what kind of gave them an initial space to do things if you like was that kind of radical impulse, yeah? So that's maybe a question for makerspaces today, is, is, you know, what's the sort of um, radical impulse? You know, is it things like commons based peer production or whatever? You know, what's the sort of bigger vision or picture going on here? And I think that's it. Um, <coughs> Dean's gonna talk now, I think, yeah, and take questions. If you're interested in any more of this, there's, we were able to get permission from the BBC to put an old OU Lucas plan documentary online so if you go, if you look at Lucas Pan on YouTube and then there's all sorts of um, interesting books from the period and stuff I've done um, to follow this up and I'm happy to talk to whoever about it if you want to get in touch at the bottom so thanks thanks for your attention thanks.